Towards green growth is a relatively new concept. We'll use this opportunity to explore decarbonization trends, that is, removing carbon from our activities and urban infrastructure, and to examine the past performance of some countries that have been successful in decoupling resource consumption from urban infrastructure growth to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Two key terms are important here, green growth and decoupling. So let's take them in turn to understand what they mean. Green growth means fostering economic growth and development while ensuring that natural assets continue to provide the resources and environmental services on which our well-being relies. That's the definition by the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Several organizations have been recently involved in efforts towards green growth, such as the United Nations Environment Program's Lead on the Green Economy Initiative in 2008, the OECD's published strategy towards green growth in 2011, and the World Bank's report on inclusive green growth, the pathway to sustainable development in 2012, among several others. So what is so new about green growth? After many, many years of taking the environment into consideration and by factoring in sustainability measures, cities around the world continue to face a double challenge, which is growing economic opportunities for all within the context of growing populations and addressing environmental pressures that, if left unaddressed, could undermine our ability to realize these opportunities. Green growth emerges as a viable solution to this double-sided problem, and it's where the two challenges meet by making use of the opportunities to realize the two together. So in this sense, green growth is not a replacement for sustainable development. In fact, it requires a lot of innovation and investment to sustain growth and give rise to new economic opportunities. Which brings us to the term decoupling. Decoupling is separating economic growth and human well-being from environmental impacts and resource use as defined by UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program, in 2011. In UNEP's report on decoupling natural resource use and environmental impacts from economic growth. At its simplest, decoupling means reducing the amount of resources, such as water or fossil fuels, used to produce economic growth and delinking economic development from environmental deterioration. Decoupling is breaking the link between environmental bads and economic goods. In the image here, decoupling is really the separation that happens among the curves, where economic growth continues to rise and the resource consumption continues to decline relatively and then absolutely over time. The curves, in a sense, split further and further apart. Decoupling is not about stopping growth, but rather it is about doing more with less. UNEP's report on decoupling points to evidence that decoupling is already happening, where the world's wealth, that is the world's gross domestic product, GDP, grew by a factor of 23 in the 20th century, while resource use rose by only a factor of 8. However, this will not be enough to avoid meeting resource scarcity and severe environmental limits. In other words, it is not sustainable. We'll have to consume even less and create innovations for efficient, clean, and green consumption. Referring to the research by Kennedy and Corfi Morlow on the past performance and future needs for low-carbon, climate-resilient infrastructure, an analysis of decarbonization of the urban infrastructure is an assessment of the ways to greening the gross fixed capital formation. That's the term used in their research as it pertains to infrastructure. Broadly speaking, Gross Fixed Capital Formation, GFCF, is the total value of the fixed assets in an economy. Infrastructure relates to four GFCF categories, which are dwellings, including all residential properties as well as associated structures, such as garages and all permanent fixtures installed in residences, other buildings and structures, including all non-residential buildings plus civil engineering works, such as bridges, tunnels, roads, sewers, ports, etc., Transport equipment, that is the vehicles, such as planes, trains, and automobiles, and other machinery and equipment, including industrial machinery, electrical machinery, steam generators, computers, office equipment, telecommunications equipment, agricultural machinery, and furniture. The only two categories of GFCF not relevant to infrastructure are cultivated assets and intangible fixed assets, such as mineral rights and software. This graph shows the gross fixed capital formation relative to GDP on the x-axis 
measured in percentage terms, and the government's gross fixed capital formation relative to total government expenditure on the y-axis, also measured in percentage terms. Using 2007 data, OECD countries are plotted and the line of best fit added where they correlate fairly closely. So what we're seeing here is how much the infrastructure is worth relative to a country's wealth on the x-axis and how much the government infrastructure is worth relative to all government spending in the country. Let's take the Czech Republic, for example. Located on the graph, the country's infrastructure is worth almost 27% of its GDP. And when looking from the government's perspective, the, gov the government's infrastructure is worth 10% of its overall spending. General conclusion is that in countries where there is a higher percentage of government spending going towards infrastructure, they also tend to have higher GFCF, that is, more infrastructure relative to their total wealth. This graph here shows the change in the components of the gross fixed capital formation in the OECD countries from 1980 to 2010. These components include dwellings, other buildings and structures, transport equipment, other machinery and equipment, and intangible fixed assets, which, for our purposes, are not relevant to infrastructure. The x-axis is time from 1980 to 2010. That's three decades. The y-axis is the percentage of total GFCF. Investment in dwellings, shown in dark blue, has fluctuated over the three decades and shows a general downward trend from roughly 30% in 1980 to about 22% in 2010. The bigger drop is in the non-residential buildings, shown on the graph as other buildings and structures in the red dotted line which declined from about 45% in the early 1980s to 28% in 2005 and a small increase since. The overall upward trend is in other machinery and equipment, shown as the purple line, which doubled in these three decades and includes infrastructure such as telecommunications equipment and industrial machinery, electrical machinery and steam generators. And interesting to note that the intangibles in the light blue line, such as computer software, have grown to be almost as much as transport equipment, the green line, where the transport equipment has been rather steady throughout the three decades at around 8%. Let's see to what extent countries have been able to green their infrastructure and therefore start decoupling their emissions from their economic growth. This chart here shows decoupling of CO2 from GDP. On the x-axis, there's the change in GDP in percentage terms in the time frame between 2000 and 2008 and ranges from 0% to 80%. And on the y-axis, there's the change in production-based CO2 emissions in percentage terms in the same time frame, with a zero line somewhat in the middle and goes up to 40% and down to minus 20%. Now it gets interesting. The chart is divided into three zones. Zone 1, no decoupling, and bordered by a 45-degree line. This is where GDP increases and emissions increase. It's good to see no OECD countries appearing in this zone. Zone 2 is the zone beyond that 45-degree line to the zero line, where there is relative but not absolute decoupling. Most of the countries appear in this area. This is where the change in GDP is increasing and the emissions are also increasing, but at a slower pace. And zone three is below the zero line where there is absolute decoupling. Almost 10 countries appear in this zone where the change in GDP is still increasing, but the emissions are declining. So the change in CO2 are in the negative zone. These countries have introduced innovations that have enabled them to grow economically yet reduce the resource consumption and associated emissions. In the next few slides, we'll see what's happening at the infrastructure level and what innovations have made this infrastructure greener. This chart shows change in residential GHG emissions relative to change in GFCF in dwellings. The change reflects a 10-year period from 1997 to 2007. On the x-axis, there's the change in residential GHG emissions ranging from minus 80% to 60%. And on the y-axis, there's the change in gross fixed capital formation in dwellings ranging from minus 100% to 150%. Along the zero lines on both axes, the chart is divided into four quadrants. The quadrant that interests us the most is the top left one, where green growth is happening, 
This is where an increase in buildings is apparent, yet emissions are declining. Most prominent here are Sweden and Iceland. Taking Sweden, which is in the lead, for example, what is taking place in Sweden that is making this green growth possible? If we look at Sweden's residential sector, we'll get a better idea. This chart here shows time on the x-axis from 1990 to 2009. There are two y-axes. The one on the left is the gross fixed capital formation for dwellings measured in million Swedish coronas and is represented by the solid red line. The one on the right is the GHG emissions from residential buildings measured in gigagrams of CO2 equivalent. This is like a thousand tons of CO2 put in another way and is represented by the dashed red line. The green shaded area is the time frame that was on the previous chart from 1997 to 2007, where decoupling was demonstrated. Between 1997 and 2007, Sweden's residential emissions were reduced by 72%, while investments in the building sector grew by 138%. This success appears to be due to homes switching to biomass furnaces and from fuel switching and other investments in district heating systems. For the most part, these changes came about as a result of policies in Sweden that aimed to promote and incentivize this transition, specifically through innovations and tax policies. This chart shows change in transportation GHG emissions relative to change in GFCF and transport equipment. We're still looking at the same time period between 1997 and 2007. On the x-axis, there's the change in transport GHG emissions ranging from minus 20% to 100%. And on the y-axis, there's the change in gross fixed capital formation and transport equipment ranging from minus 50% to 400%, which together form the four quadrants. Reducing GHG emissions in the transport sector is more challenging. And only two of the OECD countries analyzed appear in the quadrant that is of interest to us, demonstrating green growth and they are Germany and Japan, where both were able to achieve full decoupling of emissions in that 10-year period. Remember, the analysis only includes capital investment in transport vehicles, but not the fixed infrastructure like roads, rails, airports, etc., because these would be included under other buildings and structures in the gross fixed capital formation category. GFCF and transport vehicles grew in all countries analyzed because none appear below the zero line but there is a tiny dip in Portugal where actually there was a decline of 1%. There is relatively poor performance of countries in reducing emissions in the transport sector compared to the building sector. In the lead in this quadrant of the transportation sector is Germany. So what's going on there that's making green growth possible? There have been increasing transportation investments and activity during this period, but higher fuel prices and an introduction of an eco tax created a shift towards diesel powered cars and purchases of more fuel-efficient vehicles for both passenger and freight. Other factors contributing to lowering the GHG emissions included the increased use of biofuels, policies for low-emission zones in cities, and tolls for freight vehicles on the Autobahn, the German highways. And lastly, this chart shows change in power and industry GHG emissions relative to change in GFCF and other machinery and equipment. The GHG emissions included are for energy industries like power and heat generation and manufacturing industries, construction and industrial processes. On the x-axis, there's the change in power and industry GHG emissions ranging from minus 30% to 50%. And on the y-axis, there's the change in gross fixed capital formation in other machinery and equipment ranging from 0% to 180%. This axis doesn't fall below zero meaning that all countries analyzed experienced growth in this sector. So in this case, we have only two quadrants. But only nine experienced growth in addition to a reduction in GHG emissions, which appear in the left quadrant. The leading example in the power and industry sector is Denmark, which decreased its emissions by 25% between 1997 and 2007, while increasing its GFCF by almost 50%. How did Denmark achieve this green growth and demonstrate this decoupling? Well, Denmark's energy policy since the 1970s supports an increasing use of combined heat and power, renewables like wind energy and energy conservation, and though its economy has grown, the energy demand has stayed relatively constant. 
What we can learn from the evidence of green growth that is already taking place is that it is happening. What we know for sure is that globally, the gross fixed capital formation, at least across the sectors presented here, buildings, transportation, power and industry, will be on the rise. And the question we need to address is how can future infrastructure be green? The quick answer is that government leaders in cities be encouraged to develop infrastructure and growth plans taking climate change goals into consideration right at the planning stages. The more challenging responses will be to identify what innovations, policies and actions are possible. Here is where different cities will have different solutions that are contextualized to their needs and challenges to address this and to evolve the green economy.